Good afternoon. I'm Mary Beth Vitale, and thanks for joining us on this Compensation Committee webcast series. The use of total shareholder return as an incentive metric to drive long-term value has come into question based on recent research by Perlmeyer and Cornell University. Today we will examine the case for and against TSR, and more importantly, we're going to hear about Perlmeyer's unique approach that can identify better incentive compensation metrics for your company's individual circumstances. I'm joined today by Matt Turner and Brett Heron from the firm's Chicago office. They're going to present some very useful detail on how you can design a compensation program around the metrics that are most likely to drive value creation for your organization, and they'll also provide some real-life examples to illustrate the concepts. Before we begin, Renell Perry with NACD's education team has a few housekeeping announcements. Thank you, Mary Beth. Audience, submit a question and receive your answer directly from Perlmeyer today. You will also be opted in to receive future executive compensation thought leadership from Perlmeyer. Also, please tweet live with at NACD and at Perlmeyer. You can download the presentation and access additional resources right within this console. Slides are available at Perlmeyer.com forward slash performance measures for value creation and within this console. You will automatically receive one NACD credit for your participation. The credit can be applied to your NACD fellowship. If you have questions about NACD fellowships, please see the email address for more details. Again, a replay and slides will be available early next week at nacdonline.org and perlmeyer.com. Mary Beth, back to you. Thanks, Grinnell. As I mentioned, we're going to focus today on how to determine which performance metrics will help drive success for your company. As you might have guessed, there's not one single answer that works for everyone. I'm going to turn it over to Matt Turner now to tell us why. Thank you, Mary Beth. <clears throat> okay, let's start just with a quick uh, recap of a couple of items from last uh, month's webinar on the top five topics uh, for compensation committees. And one of those, as we've alluded to, was the rise of the prevalence of TSR, and in particular, relative TSR in incentive compensation programs. It has really become quite popular. Uh, but why and to what end? Uh, first, uh, just a, a couple of points to reiterate. Uh, we've done some research recently with Cornell University, and we wanted to understand if there was a link between the use of TSR as a metric and firm performance. Uh, and somewhat surprisingly, we found that there wasn't really a link. And in fact, in some of the tests that we ran, there was actually a, a weak negative link. So uh, TSR is not an incentive metric. Um, although it does have some, some uses that uh, are, uh, are good for, for public companies. And you can see in the graph to the right that there are some reasons that uh, companies cite for including TSR in their plans. Uh, number one, there is an alignment with investors and management uh, interests almost by definition. Uh, number two, create a balance uh, to existing financial metrics. So there's a balance between the types of measures being used. Peer practices are cite, cited and somewhat less uh, uh, popular in terms of thinking about the importance uh, respond to investor concerns uh, and or respond to proxy advisor concerns, uh, a couple of realities that I think all public companies uh, need to deal with. Um, so we know TSR is a strong measure for linking to value creation, uh, but we also think that there are some, some uh, there, there are better measures that ought to be included in the incentive framework to make sure you've got the right linkage between your firm's business uh, and incentive compensation. So if we can go to the next slide. Let's, let's just talk about TSR and, and why it might be appropriate for you and why it might not or in what balance. First, on, on, on the appropriate side, TSR is terrific for aligning with shareholders, as I mentioned earlier, by definition. Uh, another thing to think about is TSR is an objective performance standard. Uh, unlike uh, financial measures, there isn't a lot of wiggle room for the calculation. Once you've determined who you're going to compare TSR to, once you've determined how to treat companies that might drop out of that peer group for various reasons, it's pretty much a mechanical calculation, and so it's great from the standpoint of objectivity. The third thing to think about, let's recognize that TSR 
is an assessment of value creation from the standpoint of capitalized value. In other words, it reflects value creation in a way that financial measures that are backward looking uh, do not uh, capture. And when you think about the, uh, the responsibilities and decisions that senior executives make, they're very much about positioning the company for future value creation. And TSR certainly plays a role in assessing that value creation uh, objectively. And then finally, on a practical note, uh, there is a positive view with the use of TSR as a metric by external shareholders uh, and by uh, the, uh, the investment advisors. On the other side, uh, in terms of against TSR, uh, TSR doesn't provide any line of sight. Uh, it's kind of like telling your team, all right, uh, we're into a huddle, we're going to call play, we're calling touchdown on one. Well, of course you want to score a touchdown, but it matters how you get there. So you don't have line of sight. It doesn't tell anyone how to create value. It simply measures value. And that's great, except that it crowds out measures that probably do provide line of sight and help your management team understand what's important in terms of executing strategy. So you've, you've only got so much space to fit measures into your performance framework. Make sure you've got enough room to focus on that line of sight. The second point is performance assessment can be clouded by exogenous factors. Uh, they might be outside of management's control, or at least uh, largely outside of their control. The issue here is that TSR tells you how much value is being created, but it doesn't necessarily tell you how much of that is due to management effort. And then thirdly, let's not forget that TSR is already embedded in the existing equity incentives of your incentive program. If you're using stock options, restricted stock, performance shares, the vehicle you're using reflects TSR as well. So even if you don't have TSR or relative TSR as an explicit metric, but you're using equity compensation, you are linked to TSR. Hey, Matt, I'd like to ask you a question. Um, as a board member, you know, we hear about the pay for performance and how TSR is the metric they would like us to use. How will ISS look at this if you choose that that's not the major um you know, the TSR is not where you're going to be using in terms of measuring the value creation, maybe some other ways in executive comp. What are they going to do to your scorecard? Well, uh, that, that's a great question. Uh, ISS in particular doesn't need to see that you have TSR as an explicit measure. What they do want to see is when they run their pay for performance test uh, and they look at three year uh, received compensation versus three year performance. They define performance as TSR relative to a peer group. So uh, on one hand, if you don't have relative TSR in your, in your performance measurement framework and your performance maybe have a tenuous link to value creation over the short or medium term, you run the risk that at any given time you might look like you're overpaying or underpaying uh, your executive team. On the other hand, you can pay your, your, your executive team exclusively on relative TSR and you're virtually guaranteed that you're going to pass that test for ISS. The problem, of course, is you've now created an incentive compensation plan that has zero line of sight. Uh, with, with Glass Lewis, just to mention them, they like to see a, mul a, a, a multiple number of measures in the incentive plan framework, not necessarily relative to TSR, but it's one of those other measures that might be included in the mix that they look at. Great, thanks. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And uh, speaking of the for and against uh, the use of TSR, Brett and I have a couple cases we'd like to share with you uh, uh, around companies that have recently dealt with the question of how much TSR or relative TSR should be in their incentive framework. This first example uh, is a manufacturing company, and they have up to very recently had 100% of their long-term incentive linked to relative TSR. Uh, it's been all delivered in performance shares, and the sole measure was relative TSR. Now, they've done very well. If you, if you go back to the time of the, uh, the financial meltdown, this particular company was in very strong financial shape, especially relative to its peers. They responded very quickly, uh, very responsibly. The company was in a very strong position, and they had several uh, uh, strong long-term incentive cycles coming out of the financial meltdown uh, over the past several years. Uh, and so that plan actually paid out very well for them. A little more recently, they've had some retirements amongst their senior executive team, uh, and uh, new CEO and CFO have come up uh, from uh, uh, the next level in, in the organization. At the same time, as we've gotten to more normal, uh, a more no normal operating environment, what happened within the peer group is that three or four companies actually shook out. They simply didn't survive the financial meltdown, 
and now you have survivor peers that actually have what we're referring to as kind of TSR surges. They've survived, they've, they've hit the ground running, and they've got a lot of runway for financial performance improvement, and so their TSR has actually been doing very well, and very well relative to this company. Uh, well, this is happening at the same time that you've got uh, a new set of senior executives, their relative TSR plan is performing actually uh, below median. And this is all at a time when this organization still is delivering top quartile financial performance, and so there's a feeling that there's a bit of a misalignment or at least a bit of an imbalance in the performance framework. So the result is this company is actually carving into its performance share plan uh, to make relative TSR not the sole metric and focus on long-term growth that's uh, relevant within their industry. So let's go to the next slide. I'm going to turn it over to Brett to share the next case. Thanks, Matt, and uh, welcome everyone today to uh, our webinar. Uh, this case is somewhat uh, an opposite uh, of the case Matt just described in terms of the, the end result, but, but similar in a, uh, in a beginning context. Um, this is a construction company that uh, utilizes some fairly rigorous goal-setting processes under all of its incentive plans, the annual incentive plan as well as a uh, long-term cash plan. Now, the long-term cash plan is primarily tied to an economic profit style measure. Uh, within the performance share plan, they do include a relative TSR component, but, it, but at the end of the day, it only represents about 15% of, of total long-term incentive value. Now, with the global slowdown in, in industry sector, some weak demand, and uh, driven by some commodity price declines, it's experienced some, some headwinds in its TSR um, after several years of, of very strong TSR and, and financial performance. Uh, it continues to perform fairly well against its own internal financial performance benchmarks, kind of aligned with business strategy but has significantly suffered from a TSR component, and the TSR, uh, uh, the relative TSR component has not paid out for, uh, for a few years now. Now, as it has led to some concerns over pay and TSR alignment because the, the annual incentive plan as well as the uh, other aspects of the measurement framework based on financial performance continue to pay out well. Uh, we have seen some concerns over pay and TSR alignment at this company. As a result of these concerns, the company is taking some actions to enhance the sensitivity of its pay programs to TSR by doing a couple of things. One is adding a relative TSR to the cash LTIP, so enhancing the, uh, the overall measurement framework's sensitivity to TSR. Um, adding a payout cap under the relative TSR plan for negative TSR performance. And finally, it is recalibrating uh, some performance goals under both the annual incentive plan as well as the long-term cash plan. So th this is another example of a company that's continuing to uh, refine how TSR is used within the incentive compensation framework to kind of balance all of those competing objectives. So, so Brett, uh, if I understand correctly here, this is this is a good example of a company that, uh, instead of simply dialing forward or backward on the percentage of long-term incentive that's tied to relative TSR, they've actually looked at uh, a different way to use TSR, use it as a TSR modifier, and use it as as a, uh, kind of a positive TSR hurdle in in some of the aspects as well. So, there's different that, ways to tweak that TSR linkage. That's right. That's right. So it's it's not a uh, they're not simply increasing the weight of TSR. They are just using TSR differently from uh, you know the conventional methodology. Uh, next slide, please, Rennell. So as companies consider moving away from TSR, the the natural question then becomes you know what do we use instead? Now, before we answer that question with any degree of specificity, uh, we want to step back and look uh, at its most basic level, the systems and, and processes that drive decision making. Now, now with any company, uh, we look at the ultimate goal uh, as shareholder value creation. And every company, by definition, has that unique path to shareholder value creation, um, supported by a, a business strategy and the market opportunity as defined by you know, market economics, uh, a company's competitive positioning and its ability to um, exploit its, its competitive advantages. Uh, that ability to exploit uh, 
competitive advantages over the long term, um, we see as being reflected in two to three key financial performance metrics, which we refer to as kind of the centerpiece financial performance measures. Now, these centerpiece financial performance measures can uh, typically be uh, disaggregated further into what we refer to as uh, what we call driver measures or a combination of, of leading and lagging uh, or coincident performance measures. As we move further down the, uh, the triangle, uh, you know, we can see how these driver measures are, are linked back uh, and, and directly reflect the, the thousands of decisions that employees make every day in the context of, of corporate decision-making processes around resource allocation and, and uh, decision-making, uh, answering questions, you know, sh should equipment be shut down, are, are inventory levels sufficient, or should we be reordering, should we invest in project, uh, project X or expand into, into country Y. Now, uh, in an incentive plan design context, you know, the best measures, uh, we see the best measures are, are those that really directly tie to uh, achievement of the business strategy, are transparent, uh, calibrated appropriately, and provide that real line of sight that Matt talked about between uh, decision making and compensation. Uh, next slide, please, Renell. Now this slide uh, really summarizes uh, the key inputs to, to measure selection that we just reviewed on the prior slide, but then asks the follow-on question. What performance measures provide the best ongoing assessment of strategy execution and shareholder value creation? Now we haven't said it explicitly, but it should be clear from these two slides that in the context of incentive design and measure selection, we're very partial to uh, company-specific factors and those measures that are most closely aligned with business strategy. Now, we obviously haven't talked about um, uh, standard prevalence analysis. Uh, you know, selecting EPS growth or or return on equity uh, because other companies are doing it, you know, may provide some safety in numbers, uh, but doing what everyone else is doing, to put it mildly, is never a, a defensible pay strategy. But we do understand the appeal of the external perspective for purposes of measure selection. So let's talk about it on the next slide. So uh, co companies often look externally for guidance in, in measure selection. Uh, you know, the external perspective certainly provides additional value in, in that decision-making calculus. Uh, the, the chart here on page 12 uh, demonstrates that while peer practices and comparisons are not always used, they're clearly used by most companies uh, uh, most of the time. A bit less likely to be used for purposes of a measure selection are what we refer to as advanced analytics. A correlation time series analysis that uh, are used to uh, that can be used to determine the link between financial performance measures and and total shareholder return. Uh, this chart says also a bit less likely is the consideration uh, of tailored or or non-standard performance measures. Uh, as an example, uh, measuring taxes on a cash basis versus an accrual basis, or using property, plant, and equipment at, uh, at cost as opposed to the uh, book or, or depreciated value. Now, the, the use of, of non-standard performance measures is, is, tends to be driven by uh, company-specific facts and circumstances and is not really uh, you know, part and parcel to the standard metric selection process. process. Uh, you know, some companies may not do it, uh, uh, may not consider the use of, of tailored performance measures simply because the complexity may not be worth the, uh, the increase in, in economic decision, in economic relevance or, or uh, uh, in term, uh, may not be worth the value that the, the additional precision uh, provides. Now, in today's environment, we can certainly add concerns about transparency. Um, to the to the list of concern, um, you know, any complex uh, metric customization certainly ha runs a risk of creating negative perceptions. So, you know, if a company does decide that it wants to, um, you know, modify a, a conventional performance measure, 
or, or a conventional definition of performance, there ought to be very good reasons for doing it, you know, with clearly explained rationale. Uh, Brett, I have a question for you. Um, it was a, noted in Bloomberg about a month ago that the CEO of BlackRock, Larry Fink, he sent letters to all the CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. And what he was saying in there, he said that given today's culture of quarterly earnings hysteria, it's totally contrary to the long-term approach we need. And he said that rather than focusing on deviations from analyst earnings, um, he estimates he urged management to use quarterly reports to demonstrate progress against strategic. Uh, Fink went on to ask the CEO to provide an annual strategic framework reviewed by board members for long-term value creation. So when we're talking about long-term value creation with TSR, do you think that by him doing this that that adds any value or um, gives more weight or importance to TSR? You know, certainly uh, uh, BlackRock maintains a, a very influential role in uh, in institutional investor circles. So certainly, uh, given the ownership positions that BlackRock has in lots of companies out there, you know, CEOs certainly uh, are going to listen to what the CEO of BlackRock says. Um, and certainly, the uh, the points he made certainly resonate with with lots of firms out there and, and lots of uh, 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 proxy advisor firms as well as you know traditional comp consultants. So certainly what he says is relevant. Uh, whether companies get away from the quarterly guidance game, uh, you know that's a, a fairly big hurdle to to manage. But certainly uh, talking to uh, companies, it's important for companies to talk about long-term strategic plans. Um, it's important to link compensation metrics to those long-term, to, to the long-term strategy. Uh, you know, it certainly provides some support for moving away from relative TSR, but BlackRock also feels very strongly about pay and TSR alignment. So I don't know if, it, if the letter uh, specifically uh, causes you know me to think about it one way versus the other, but certainly you know there he he does support the linking of compensation to measure to long term measures other than TSR. Got it. Any, Good. Any, anything to add on that, Matt? Well, just I think that's a good segue because we're gonna we're gonna talk about <clears throat> how we can link into uh, long term value creation and and be able to demonstrate that the measures uh, uh, we can use for incentive compensation have that, that, uh, that tangible link to, to value creation. Brett, Brett's mentioned uh, here on page 12 this, this idea of correlation analysis and statistical studies. That's, that's actually our next, uh, our next topic here. So you can see on uh, slide 13 there's a, there's, a, uh, there's a colorful picture at the bottom here. What, what, we, what we're going to talk about is uh, using basically doing a little math, uh, using statistical analysis to help ground measures in a demonstrated link to shareholder value. So if you are concerned about that BlackRock uh, letter, this is actually a pretty good uh, place to, to focus some attention because it allows you to validate that the measures you're selecting and using an incentive compensation really do link to shareholder value creation. Below in this chart, what you'll see is across the horizontal are several uh, financial measures uh, in terms of growth, earnings, and, and returns. Uh, and the height of the bar relates to the strength of the relationship between each of those measures and shareholder value. In the case of growth measures and income growth measures, uh, it's, it's a link to total shareholder return. In the case of margin measures and return measures, it's the link to the market to book ratio for the company. And we've, we've taken a look in this example at the link between one-year periods, three-year periods, and five-year periods. We could certainly customize that further. But the idea is uh, we want to focus on measures we know are going to link to long-term long shareholder value. So take sales growth as an example. You can see that sales growth over the long term uh, has a pretty strong uh, connection to shareholder value creation for this particular company in this particular industry. In the short run, the green bar for sales, uh, it's less strong. So that might suggest that when you think about sales growth as a measure, uh, 
it might uh, fit very nicely into a long-term incentive plan. Uh, and you know we, we don't need to cover all the measures here, but return on invested capital has a has a, a strong uh, link to value creation as well. Again, stronger in the long run in the short term than in the short run, suggesting that uh, it's clear that there can be some noise in a one-year return measure, uh, and a longer-term average ROIC uh, gives a better indication of value creation. Now, this is just uh, a beginning point to understand. This tells us that there is some link. It doesn't necessarily tell us that the measures with lower correlations uh, are not linked to shareholder value. Uh, what we are learning here is that those measures probably aren't uh, linked to shareholder value across the industry in the same way. In other words, gross margin might be very important for your business. It might be important for all your peers as well, but there's a wide range of gross margin performance out there, and what matters is where you're going with gross margin from your starting position. So let's go to the next slide. So the next case we're going to talk about uh, kind of takes what we saw on the prior page to the next level and says, all right, we've, we've seen the statistical analysis. Now let's think about our business strategy and whether or not uh, anything marries up to give us some answers about long-term measures. This particular company, uh, part of its strategy was to continue, to continue to grow at an economically profitable level. In other words, we're going to grow, but we're going to grow profitably, and we're going to leverage what we believe are our competitive advantages in the marketplace. Uh, we have a strong position from the standpoint of manufacturing excellence and innovation in the manufacturing process. Uh, this is a specialty chemicals indus uh, industry company, so the manufacturing process is really important from quality control and ability to uh, produce economically uh, feasible uh, compounds for their, for their clients. Uh, they also have top-level tailored customer service, so they're kind of at the opposite end of the commodities uh, within their industry. Now, we did, anal we did analysis similar to what you saw on the prior page, and it said return on net assets, or return on the depreciated assets, or our, our common definition of RONA, demonstrates a pretty strong alignment with shareholders. Uh, but we make note, through understanding their, their business strategy, that RONA can actually discourage new capital investments. Let's say you're, you're working with a largely depreciated asset base, uh, and you're delivering strong return on net assets, and then you make big investments in new capital equipment, it's all hitting your books on an undepreciated basis. Uh, it's going to inflate the denominator of a RONA calculation and drive your RONA down. So we also looked at return on gross assets, or a cash return basis. So that's cash earnings over uh, cash-based uh, uh, price of, of assets, or undepreciated assets, and saw that it was pretty well co uh, correlated with shareholder value as well. Not quite as well as RONA, but it was still pretty strongly correlated. So this company knew that it was moving into a period of three to five years that was going to require a lot of new investment in its manufacturing processes across different lines. It did not want to send the wrong signals to its management team to put the brakes on that investment. So they went with return on gross assets over return on net assets because that married up better with their business strategy. Okay, next slide. So that's a little bit about identifying what we refer to as centerpiece financial measures. So the growth and return measures that help you understand if you're delivering economically profitable uh, growth uh, consistent with your business strategy. Once you have those measures identified and you think about the rest of your incentive compensation framework, you want to think about the other measures that can help round out your performance measurement framework so that you're, you're covering financial measures, uh, maybe some operational and, and strategic measures that are very specific to your, your business strategy. And of course, if you've determined that uh, total shareholder return belongs in the framework, uh, that may fit as well. The chart at the bottom of page 15, uh, we refer to as a performance measurement framework worksheet. We find this to be helpful because if you think about what kind of measures belong in an incentive plan, um, oftentimes you get, you get blinders on it. You're talking about the long-term incentive plan, and you're thinking, well, we've got to cover this, we've got to cover that, and you feel like you want to make sure you've covered all the bases. Uh, but really, you have a system of incentives in your organization, and it's helpful to think about them uh, in total. And that way, you can make sure you've got a complementary nature between your incentive plans and the measures being used, and you can avoid redundancy of measurement coverage and make sure you've got the right weight across the different measures that are consistent with your business strategy. Okay, next slide, I'm going to turn it over to Brett to talk a little bit more about those, those uh, exceptions to the rules and tailoring. We covered that a little bit, but there's a little bit more to be said here. Thanks, Matt. 
um, sometimes it may make sense to, on a long-term basis, to to modify a, a conventional or, or gap re reported financial measure uh, to more precisely or, or accurately assess operational performance, or, or potentially to correct for some type of, of performance distortion. Now, I'm not going to read all of the uh, potential uh, ways in which you might consider modifying a, a standard uh, or a conventional performance measure, uh, but I am going to talk a few rec talk about a few recent client examples. Um, one issue that that many companies have been wrestling with uh, over the past uh, probably two years now is the issue of exchange rates. Um, the, the U.S. dollar has been performing uh, very well against currencies outside the U.S. and Companies operating globally have been really have really been facing an uphill battle with the strength of the U.S. dollar and and converting uh, foreign currencies back into uh, into U.S. dollars. Um, so a, a recent client was wrestling with this issue and was considering excluding the impact of of some of this unplanned currency fluctuation from incentive calculations. Now the way they approached this in, in determining how they what they wanted to do, whether they wanted to kind of include or, or exclude uh, the impact of the currency fluctuations, really came down to uh, a question of, of of from an operational perspective how they manage and hedge kind of their currency uh, their currency exposure. Now this company does does spend some time um, trying to manage and hedge that exposure. But they also understood the the limits of their forecasting capabilities. So what they ultimately ended up doing was uh, kind of adopting a policy where the impact of exchange rate fluctuations outside of a, a predetermined range um, would be excluded from incentive pay calculations on a go-forward basis. And so that's a policy that has now but been put kind of in place on, on a go-forward basis. Uh, the second instance that I'll, I'll briefly mention is a client um, that relies extensively on the leasing of capital assets. Now, when we compare uh, the client against uh, both internal performance benchmarks um, as well as external performance benchmarks, we, we actually go through and capitalize all the operating lease commitments and basically restate financial performance um, to kind of hold the company accountable for for earning a return on its uh, on its off balance sheet financing arrangements. So those are just two examples, and again, a lot of these are determined based on the facts and circumstances uh, of a company and how they best want to uh, manage and assess operational uh, operational performance. Uh, next slide, please, Renell. Um, so once. Uh, key performance measures are identified, it's important to, to understand uh, the limitations. Uh, you know, companies and committees have a broad understanding of, of uh, you know, when exogenous factors unrelated to, to value creation or management efforts may be um, uh, impacting financial performance results. Now, the, the key difference between the examples that we talk about on this page and, and those on the prior slide is that these tend to be less operational in nature and generally reflect a, a one-time event. Now, the, the simple example to illustrate the issue on, on page 17 is the, is the classic case um, that the, the easiest way to grow earnings per share is simply uh, to use stock to acquire a company with a lower PE ratio than your own. That's obviously a, a simple example, and, and addressing that case is fairly, is fairly straightforward. Uh, but you know, in managing the exception and relief process, there are, there are several questions that, that management and committees should be prepared, be prepared to discuss. Um, uh, those questions include what and who uh, led to the rise of the uh, event in question. Uh, is the event synthetic in nature, or are uh, you know are real dollars at stake here? Uh, how has the company and the comp committee handled similar events in the past? Um, you know, which does imply that you know the company should make an effort to maintain a history of of these uh, uh, cases um, uh, in the past. So just to serve as a some guidance or a guideline for making decisions in the future. Uh, Another question that often considered in this uh, exception process 
you know, does it make sense to stretch out the time frame um, uh, before you know you pay on, on an exception, um, or is it likely that the event in question will you know reverse itself at some point in the future? Um, you know, ultimately, companies should take the time to discuss how. Uh, uh, discretion might be used to adjust for these events, and, and comp committee members obviously, uh, you know, how they feel about such actions. Um, you know, committee members generally know their own limits um, and and understand where they're willing to draw the line in terms of what they will and they won't consider in the uh, in the relief process. And now I'm going to uh, hand it back to Matt. Okay, great. Thanks, Brett. So <clears throat> at this point, we're going to shift our, our, our uh, attention from measurement selection and, and talk a little bit about calibrating performance goals. So once you've got those measures identified, it's really critical to make sure that when you set goals that they're set appropriately. Um, there's, uh, there's some text here in the middle of this page that probably looks familiar to you. It's, uh, you know, you change a few words and it probably is very common to a lot of CDNAs. Most companies do indicate that they intend for their programs to deliver pay for performance. Nothing controversial there whatsoever. Uh, but oftentimes, uh, there are some important questions that go unanswered. Does target mean the same for us as it does for other peers? How does superior performance impact our actual pay positioning against the market? In other words, what's the leverage that's inherent in our incentive compensation programs? How about threshold and below threshold? So the, the leverage both directions. And then finally, how difficult is it for our team to achieve target performance or maximum performance? And again, relative to peers, that, that can be an important question. Next slide, please. So uh, just, just a few things on relative difficulty. Um, in general, when you think about setting goals, um, there, there, are some, there are some rules of thumb. Uh, for, the, for an average management team over the long run, you should expect that superior or near superior performance and payout are achieved 10 to 20% of the time, that you're going to be at or above target uh, 50 to 60% of the time, and that you're generally going to be at or above threshold, so you're not going to fall below threshold. Uh, you're going to be above threshold 80 to 90% of the time. It turns out that this, this kind of implied bell curve is quite valid. We've looked at uh, actual payout data across many companies and over many years from surveys, uh, and this, this curve holds pretty well. Uh, some industries and specific peer groups may differ. We do find that the bell curve kind of shifts to a more generous payout uh, for financial service companies, uh, big surprise, uh, but generally speaking, that bell curve kind of holds. Now, the, the caveat here is that um, that's for an average management team over a long term. Um, and clearly, if you have a superior management team or you have a team that has managed to deliver superior results, those results might skew to the more, you know, to the higher payout levels, and the converse is also true. Um, but we don't want to just accept that that's the case. We want to make sure that we can, we can support that. Does the company's stock price performance actually support that belief? Are you confident that the measures of performance you've selected, do they really matter for shareholder value? Uh, and is the current management team driving the performance results or is it exploiting the cumulative effect of economic rents or other advantages that it may have inherited from prior management teams or from the company's history? The next page, please. So uh, to be a little more tangible about that, um, let's look at an example here. Um, what this chart shows is a 10-year average payout history for a company's annual and long-term incentive plans, that's the orange line, showing that over a 10-year period, uh, the average payout has been about one and a half times target. So a pretty strong history of payout. At the same time, the company's total shareholder return relative to its peers in industry has been below median. It's been about the 41st percentile of TSR. So there's a bit of a problem here, and we think it could be two things. One is uh, maybe we have the wrong measures. Um, but if you look at this graph, at least we have an initial thought that the measures look like they're tracking with total shareholder return fairly well. And in this particular case, we actually felt like the measures were very strongly linked to shareholder value. The problem was that the goals that were being set, quite frankly, were too easy. Over the long run, the, the incentive payout uh, factor was systemically higher than the total shareholder return payout, 
And so what this said is we need to get a little tougher with the goals that we're setting and make sure that we're reflecting what shareholders are expecting from this company. Next slide, please. And I'm going to turn it over to Brett to talk about how we go about with that, uh, with that process with, with committees. Thanks, Matt. Uh, now, I'm going to hit this slide quickly because I want to ensure that we have enough time at the end for questions. Um, so uh, 21 uh, basically says that compensation committees are spending more time on, on goal setting um, in, in today's environment, ensuring that you know, incentive goals ha have the appropriate degree of rigor. Uh, you know, the traditional process can be summarized by a, a budget-driven goal setting process. You know, with some pressure to approve the goal just in time to ensure, uh, you know, 162M deductibility. Um, you know, that process is evolving. Uh, companies are are incorporating multiple perspectives uh, in terms of performance, and then pressure testing those performance scenarios with compensation outcomes to ensure a degree of comfort with the the pay and performance results. Uh, Companies are increasingly sensitive to the broader HR implications around goal setting and ensuring that we're using, uh, you know, all of the resources that a company can bring to bear around goal setting. And uh, finally, uh, you know, committees are asking these questions earlier in the in the process now. Um, they want to ensure a more thoughtful goal setting process and really move forward from the traditional, you know, goal setting approach that we've seen in the past. Uh, Brad, I've got a question for you and like to get your thought about what do you think the role, you know, you just mentioned about HR, so what do you think the role of the head of HR is in respect to the comp committee? Uh, do you, you know, first, do you see many of them um, at the comp committee or is it usually the CFO dealing with the, the committee? And um, in general, do you think heads of HR are, are capable um, and dealing with the strategic issues surrounding comp, or they, do they tend to be more tactical in making sure the employees get paid and they're in legal and compliance, um, you know, agreements and things? Yeah, that's a good question, uh, Mary Beth. Um, I, I recently heard a quote that someone said that that HR folks um, uh, several years ago had uh, the time but didn't have the expertise to add value in these kinds of, of, of discussions. You know, with the increasingly strategic role that HR plays, uh, the bar has been raised for what HR leaders can contribute to these discussions. And now HR leaders really have, uh, today they don't have enough time, but they certainly have the, the, the expertise and the experience to, you know, contribute to these discussions around, around goal setting. So. Uh, you know, in the past where the CFO may have led the discussions around incentive plan goal setting, certainly I think HR is viewed much more as a strategic partner uh, in, as part of those discussions. So certainly the, uh, the paradigm around the HR's role in, in these discussions has changed. Good. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this slide starts to go into the various perspectives that can be considered in the goal setting process. And I'm going to uh, um, hit on a couple of topics here on slide 22, but discuss them in a, in a fairly different way. Now, when we think about the goal setting process, we can take those, the, the standard inputs and uh, put them in a classic two by two framework. Uh, you know, one axis we're gonna, one axis we're going to look at the inputs that are historical in nature, versus those that represent prospective or, or forward looking expectations. And the other axis we would uh, look at inputs that are really uh, company specific, versus those that really reflect broader industry benchmarks. And uh, by taking kind of those four boxes. Um, you know, we really we can really incorporate multiple perspectives um, as we talk about goal setting, ensuring that we're setting goals with the with the right degree of of difficulty and the and an appropriate degree of rigor. And we think that process results in a, incorporating all of those inputs results in a much more thoughtful process and, and fulsome discussion when setting in uh, performance hurdles. Uh, next slide, please, Renell. 
uh, again, this is just uh, some data from a study that we did a few years ago that looked at the, uh, the, the various factors that companies use to, to set performance goals. I don't think there's any surprises here. Um, I think the one thing that, that is a little surprising uh, for us is how far down uh, on the list uh, Wall Street earnings guidance and, and forecasts by external a uh, analysts in terms of how prevalent uh, those factors are used to set performance goals. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Matt, back to you. Okay, thank you, Brett. <clears throat> so um, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go deep on this, this page. Um, and uh, for those of you that uh, don't like math class, that's probably good. Uh, the main point I'd like to make here is, you know, as Brett was talking about those multiple perspectives that come into play for setting goals, uh, and we think that uh, all of those perspectives, to one extent or another, are worth taking a look at at most companies. So not relying on a single uh, perspective is really important. The one that we think is, is getting less, much less play than it ought to get is an explicit look at shareholder expectations based on a company-specific modeling uh, by the company as opposed to analyst uh, expectations of earnings. Um, we tend to use an economic profit model tool. Uh, basically, it's like an EVA type uh, measure where we look at the kind of financial performance and the levels of financial, financial performance that can be inferred from a company's prevailing share price. And we can also take a look at this for a company's peers to understand how those expectations might differ from, uh, from the company to its peers. Um, it's based on the old Gordon dividend growth model, uh, of course. Uh, it's just uh, got a few more bells and whistles on it to make sure it takes into account more economic factors. Let's go to the next page. So, um, so how does this work? Um, a case I think illustrates this pretty well. Uh, this is a company that has had uh, pretty strong performance. They, they happen to operate in a business where they enjoy very strong uh, uh, profit margins and gross margins. Uh, they're very efficient about the use of capital. They are delivering very strong return on invested capital, consistently top quartile against the peers. Their sales growth is about median. It's close to what uh, the rest of the peers are doing. And its total shareholder return is close to median. So already something kind of draws our attention here that, uh, you know, this company is outperforming on financial performance with ROIC, but the TSR is pretty much close to median. So what we take away from that is uh, the company's shareholders actually expect this company to outperform peers on ROIC. Uh, now, the company's putting in place a new performance share plan based on three-year ROIC. I'm sure I'll finish up this quickly. <clears throat> uh, and, and sales growth. The company's budget forecast, and this is based on its long-range plan, actually sees a modest decline in ROIC and more aggressive growth in sales. So kind of flipping the performance uh, measure, performance that it has heretofore enjoyed. That's going to be driven by a lot of uh, organic growth and some acquisition activity. Uh, so um, the, 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 the compensation committee in particular is a bit of a cat on a hot tin roof about this and wants to understand, you know, if we set goals based on these assumptions, are we going to be okay with what happens with total shareholder return? It turns out the shareholder expectations analysis that we're talking about helped them to validate that the model of future performance they were looking at uh, could be validated from today's share price, and they, they uh, gained some confidence in setting goals for their new long-term plan. Let's go to the next slide. And to allow time for questions, I'm going to move quickly here. There are five uh, goal-setting pitfalls to avoid. We've touched on these to one extent to another as we move through here. Number one, don't rely on a single measure, uh, and in particular, don't simply rely on the budget process. Number two, uh, presuming that financial performance relative to peers is as relevant uh, as stock price relative to peers. We, in the case we just talked about, we saw that financial performance relative to peers didn't necessarily tell us how a company is going to perform from a total shareholder return uh, standpoint. You need to understand your company-specific uh, expectations and those relative to the peers. Don't fixate on year-over-year -year performance or continued improvement. Depending on the measure, uh, the context may be entirely different than, than, you, than relying on year-over-year -year performance. Uh, number four, uh, make sure you do a sanity check. Make sure you model potential outcomes. Make sure you're comfortable with the, the, the implied payouts from your incentive plans for different business outcomes and performance outcomes. And then finally, let's not become too anchored to past results or circumstances and take into account uh, your particular uh, 
uh, executive team and the HR issues around the tenure and what they bring to the table and what, what they may or may not be responsible for with respect to past results. Next slide. So just to wrap up uh, where we've been with this presentation, uh, we started with talking about uh, TSR becoming a more highly prevalent metric uh, out there in incentive plan programs among public companies. The, the evidence of that is pretty clear with uh, these days a majority of uh, larger publicly traded companies using TSR explicitly. However, we are seeing and we are actually uh, uh, encouraging companies uh, to take a fresh look and find valid reasons uh, for the particular weight of TSR and the way that TSR is being uh, used in your incentive plan. Uh, and then for all companies, and this, is a, this, is a, this goes beyond public companies as well, uh, for all companies we think that incentive measures really should be grounded in business strategy, tied to shareholder value creation, and with goals that are calibrated to deliver the appropriate pay for performance results. And then finally, uh, just to come back to this point, the specific role, if any, uh, for TSR in your incentive compensation program should be tailored to your own unique business context. That concludes our formal presentation, and I'll turn it back over to Ronell for some uh, some uh, housekeeping, and then we'll we'll get to some questions. Great, thank you all. I'd like to take turn your attention to our next webinar. The next edition of the Compensation Series webinar will be on May 19th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Compensation's role in a successful M&A registration is currently open. Also, if you have fellowship questions, you can reach out to Megan Messbauer. She's the Senior Fellowship Program Manager. You can reach her at the information on the screen. I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to our moderator for questions. Thank you, Rennell. Um, we've had some excellent questions coming in, and we're going to try to get to as many as possible. And Matt and Brett, just jump in of which ones you think um, you'd like to take or in terms of answering. Uh, the first question I'd like to present is uh, that came from one of our um, webinar attendees is, when in a company's life cycle should TSR be considered as a performance metric? Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. And, and I think that the, the, the first answer is that it can be used, I think, at any, any point in a company's life cycle, but there are some points of concern uh, that we all ought to be aware of. Uh, when a company is just going public, either from an IPO or emerging from bankruptcy or some other, uh, some other case, uh, we think it's prudent to get a little trading history under your belt before you uh, uh, immediately put uh, TSR, relative TSR, into your performance framework. You're, you're certainly going to be using uh, a significant uh, uh, share of compensation will be delivered in equity for your senior executives. Uh, we'd say give it a year or two before you actually feather in a, a TSR type measure. Uh, and, and to think about companies maybe on the very mature side or on the, you know, kind of the end of a life cycle if there's kind of a, uh, uh, not a light at the end of the tunnel, but a lack of light at the end of the tunnel. You want to be careful about uh, uh, certain measures and financial measures, and you know, if, you, if you want to encourage growth, but you're actually shrinking in market size, you want to be careful there. But TSR can actually be used at that, that time as well. In fact, it's a nice counterbalance to those financial measures to make sure you're, you, you feel like you are validating and setting the right kinds of goals. The next question we received is, can you talk to differences in metrics relative to industry? For example, the financial industry was specifically mentioned. Uh, uh, go ahead, Brett. Yeah. So, yeah, this is Brett. Uh, you know, certainly the financial industry, um, you know, I don't think you find TSR as prevalent within the financial services industry. You, you do find measures that, that are specific to the financial services industry. You don't tend to find, you know, more broadly things like efficiency ratio or, you know, return on equity, uh, you know, it tends to be fairly prevalent given the, the nature of a financial services company's assets. Um, but I think the, the the process that you go through in terms of, of validating measures and, and setting goals is is very similar to what you pretty much identical to what you would go through in in looking at companies in in other industries. So I don't think there's anything specific about the financial services industry that makes it you know different than than other industries. Yeah, the thing I'd add on this is, uh, uh, you know, for financial services, you, you're, you're very likely going to be looking at return on equity as opposed to return on capital because debt is actually used as an operating input as opposed to a source of financing. Uh, but generically speaking, for, for any for-profit company, uh, 
um, you're going to start with the presumption that you know profitable growth matters, and you're going to find growth and return measures that that actually fit for your business. And for some companies, that's going to look fairly similar across industries. But as you kind of move back on a, a Dupont ROI tree or a, or a you know a value tree, the measures start to get more specific to your industry and more specific to your business strategy. So those operational, the strategic measures that are referred to in the uh, on the performance measurement framework slide, those are going to start to look much more unique and specific to your to your business than the centerpiece financial measures. And I would imagine, you know, based on your peer group, you're going to be looking at the how relative to that versus the industry versus a different industry. That's true. Yeah. Uh, to what degree would TSR improvement be a useful metric? Um, you know, we generally think about uh, TSR uh, as as a measure that is set in a particular period against other peers because there's there's broad market. Uh, conditions that might drive overall market performance one direction or another. So relative TSR really is uh, an important measure. But I don't think that uh, there's, there's, there's much value in saying, well, we were 60th percentile against our peer group in this recent period, therefore we need to do 70th percentile. That's really kind of, you know, it's really kind of taking the derivative of the measure and, and, and 60th percentile is great, but there's no reason to expect that you could, you could replicate uh, above market uh, performance in the next period. In fact, there's actually, uh, there's actually evidence from, you know, financial research that says that there is some mean reversion. So if you outperform in a particular cycle, if there's any tendency, it's going to be that you might underperform or revert to the mean in your performance in the future. So I'd say you want to take those periods and simply measure it against outperformance or underperformance and not look at year-over-year -year, uh, relative TSR performance. Another attendee asks is, we had used TSR until we found a few situations where it was unfairly constricting our ability to use our better judgment. We're thinking of going back to a portion of compensation being solely at our own discretion. Do you find many companies moving away from TSR? You know, that, that's yep. certainly a, uh, a debate that many companies are having. You know, with the rise of relative TSR plans in the uh, uh, late 2000s, you know, a lot of companies have several relative TSR cycles under their belt, and they're starting to to see some of the challenges. Uh, with these plans, you know, it doesn't allow you to define operating objectives. You, sometimes you have disconnect, disconnects between uh, some of the accounting requirements uh, of a relative TSR plan and the value you actually that executives actually realize under the plan. So I think a lot of companies are are considering moving away from TSR plans or at least repositioning the way that TSR is used with the within the incentive comp framework. Now, certainly the, the SEC's upcoming requirements for pay-for-performance disclosure is certainly going to, in fact, uh, impact the decision calculus there. So I don't think it's a, it's a discussion that will abate anytime soon. Um, in your overall experience with long-term incentive programs and your clients, what are your observations regarding goals being too relaxed? Um, well, I think by the by the law of large numbers, the, the market is generally getting it about right, and, and part of that is kind of self fulfilling because we measure relative pay uh, relative to performance. And so, uh, even if we might think that uh, compensation overall is too heavy or too light for for the uh, the value being delivered by an executive team, it's a bit self correcting. So, uh, you know, across the spectrum. It's about right. The, the issue is that particular companies may find that they have a chronic uh, conservative or chronic liberal approach to setting goals. And so we, we do think it's appropriate for companies to, uh, you know, very periodically, if not every year, take a look back, validate that you're getting the right kind of, uh, of, uh, uh, of calibration between your incentive plan payouts and the delivered performance. Uh, because on a company by company basis, you, you might be a little off. Okay, this will be the last question as we're running um, out of time here. Um, in your overall, ex uh, excuse me, that was a different one here. Uh, it seems as though ISS has enormous clout in determining fairness of pay. What is their view on TSR? Well, uh, ISS has decided, at least implicitly, if not explicitly, that, that TSR is the ultimate standard of performance. And it's really hard to argue with that. Um, but one could look at their tests and say, uh, it, it, it's too much. Uh, 
Uh, and, and, you know, there are times when even very well-run companies with very good systems in place can have a short-term, and by short-term I mean three years, uh, misalignment between their pay delivered and the relative TSR, and yet they're still doing an awful lot of things right. So, yes, ISS has a lot of influence on this point, and I think that, you know, based on some of the research we've done with Cornell, we're, we're, we're trying to call into question some things that shouldn't be accepted uh, just, you know, just without proof. So uh, ISS has a lot of influence. Uh, we think it's up to companies to do a lot of the, you know, do the right thing and for, their, for their companies and shareholders, and uh, hopefully in the long run, the conversation with ISS and others like ISS works its way to a better system. Okay. I'll turn it over to Ronell with any other last-minute um, comments. Mary Beth, that's all I have. You can go ahead and close it out, please. Okay. Um, the, if we didn't get to all the questions that were asked, uh, Perlmeyer will respond to those questions and we'll have them available to you. And I thank everyone for joining us today um, for another webinar that we've had with Perlmeyer and NECD, and we're very pleased to be partnered with them.